Thank you for joining us for our Word of the Day. This morning as we're continuing through the Bible, we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 11. In this chapter, we see the first recording of the end of Solomon's life and the end of his kingdom. And, I, you know, we just, Solomon just took the, the throne in chapter 2 of 1 Kings, and now we're already at chapter 11, and his his kingdom is ending. And, it's, you know, why are we going so fast through this? And and we didn't get a lot of Solomon, but the book of First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles record the same time period in the history of the nation of Israel. So as we get through the book of Chronicles, we're going to see more of the stories of Solomon and more of the things that he did for God. But right now we're looking at the end of his kingdom recorded in First Kings chapter 11. And Solomon started out as an incredible king. He was a king who, who loved God, who feared God in an awe-inspiring way, who understood his need for God. Uh, if you remember, when he first took the throne, God came to him and offered him anything. He said, I'll give you anything you want uh, to help you as you take this new position. And Solomon, he could have asked for wealth and prosperity, but instead he asked for wisdom. And so God gave him wisdom. So Solomon is known as the wisest king to ever rule Israel, and known as the wisest man to ever live. Most of his wisdom is found in the book of Proverbs. Uh, we see it uh, in the Song of Solomon. We see it in all these, these other wisdom books that God used Solomon to write. And he started out great. He brought Israel to the golden age. He completed the temple. He built these wonderful pools for people to worship in and, and praise God in. He built this the forest of Lebanon. He did an incredible job bringing Israel to its height of economic prosperity, of peace. But one of the ways he achieved the peace that Israel experienced under his leadership was through political marriages. Uh, it's very famously known that Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And most of these wives were political marriages. He, he didn't really live with all 700 wives. He didn't spend time with all 700 wives. The majority of them he never really even saw after the marriage, or many historians believe saw at all. And they just kind of got married by proxy. But he had all these wives and he had all these concubines uh, for political purposes. He would marry uh, daughters of his enemies to bring peace to the nation. And that's kind of how he established the, the peace that Israel experienced. But some of these wives he was actually very close to, uh, especially his, his concubines. You know, the wives were political marriages. The concubines were not. They were for his personal pleasure. And they turned his heart against God. Many of these women he actually loved and he allowed to influence him. And when he married them and they came to Israel, he allowed them to keep their gods and worship their gods as opposed to worshiping the one true God. And they, they turned his heart away from God. And look what the Bible says in chapter 11, verse number 6. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father." That's a, that's a sad commentary on the life of the wisest man to ever live, and the king that brought Israel to its, its peak and its height of prosperity and peace. The Bible says that he did not have a heart for God like David did. He allowed these women to turn his heart against God. And the Bible says he did evil in the sight of God. And look, David, we know David wasn't perfect. David had his sins. David had the sin with Bathsheba that brought all kinds of, of pain into his life and his family's life and the nation of Israel's life. He suffered because of his sin. But when he sinned, and it, his sin wasn't just against Bathsheba, he had ever, other sins recorded in the Bible where he numbered the people and things like that. But when David sinned, David repented and confessed his sin and got right with God again. Solomon didn't. Solomon never saw his, his choices as sin. He allowed his desires, his pleasure to take precedence over serving God. And that's a temptation that every single one of us face. Look, Solomon's temptation 
with sexual sin. And we live in a very sexually free culture. Uh, from even shows on TV that are that glorify uh, sex and glorify wicked lifestyles to the 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 just abundance of and the freedom that people have to access pornography on their phones and just anywhere they want to. It's it's a very sexually deviant society, and it's very easy even for God's people to fall into that temptation. Uh, one of the, the, the things I promote a lot is having accountability and having filters on all your technology. I, for one, use a program called uh, Covenant Eyes, and it filters internet access, but it also reports any, uh, m- any misuse or any questionable use to an accountability partner. My wife is my accountability partner. I'm the accountability partner of my sons. And so every week I get an email about the websites that they visited and it filters out stuff. And so we keep each other accountable to what we're viewing online. But one of the things that I love about them is they they do a lot of research. And they have shown that by the age of 18, over 90% of teenage boys have viewed pornography at least once and 60% of teenage girls. They say by that age, uh, 75% of teenage boys and 45% of teenage girls view it regularly, like daily or weekly. And they can view it on their devices, they can view it on their computers, it's just freely available. And even in Christian circles, they've, they've done things with, with pastors and, and other religious leaders, and the, the number is like over 80% of believers, even 80% of pastors struggle with pornography, and that's men and women. It's not a just a man issue, it's a man, men and women thing. And so the sexual deviancy and the, the availability for us to be tempted to fall into that lifestyle is there, and it can turn our heart from God. But it's not just sexual sin we gotta worry about, sexual temptation. Anything that we decide to do that is a violation of God's word, but it brings us pleasure or seeking our desires or our wants over God's desire and God's will is evil in the sight of God. And we have to guard our hearts. David wasn't perfect, but he guarded his heart. And when his heart wasn't right, he made sure to get it right with God. That's why he was called a man after God's own heart, even after his great sin with Bathsheba. Solomon allowed his heart to be turned from God and never got it right. That's why at the end of his life, the Bible says Solomon did evil in the sight of God, not like David. We have to guard our heart. We have to make sure that we are doing what God desires and we are seeking God's will and God's plan and God's holiness over allowing the world to tempt us to please ourselves and to fall into temptation and do what we want to do. We need to have a heart like David that when we sin, because we're going to, let's just be honest, you're going to sin. I'm going to sin. We're all going to sin because we're sinners. But when we sin, let's be like David who confess our sin, repent of it, forsake it, and get right with God. Don't be like Solomon, allow your sin to take you down a road where your heart turns cold to God and God says, you are doing evil in my sight. Thanks so much for joining us for our Word of the Day. Be sure to be back here tomorrow as we continue through the Bible. Have a blessed day.